When my great-grandmother had her first child, my great-grandmother was living in Asheville, North Carolina, in a tiny one-bedroom cabin built by her husband. The cabin was in a secluded area in the woods down dirt road. They lived a quiet life. George worked and Harriet stayed home with Ethel and cooked and cleaned like every other woman from that time period. They lay out of the cabin is sort of important here. The cabin had a big open room where the kitchen and dining area was sectioned off and then there was a wall dividing a small space where Harriet and George slept. The front door was close to the kitchen, and beside the kitchen there was a door that led to the only actual bedroom, which was Ethel's row. There was also a washroom behind the dining area that contained a very small closet. One typical June evening, Harriet was doing chores around the house as it began to get dark. She laid my five-month-old grandmother down to sleep for the night after feeding her. She had a pork roast in the oven and potatoes on the stove and mixed with sweltering southern summer humidity that she decided that she would open the front door to cool down the house a little bit. George would be getting home very soon. And she was sure he'd feel much better to sit down and not feel like he was in an oven after working in the heat all day. So she opened the front door and let the meshed screen door open to keep the bugs out. She carried on cooking and decided she was going into the washroom to wash up a bit before dinner. All of a sudden, she heard what sounded like the door shutting very loud behind her. At first she thought it was George. But, when she went out there, no one was there. She figured she had just thought she heard something and went back to finish washing. A few minutes later, she heard the distinct sound of Ethel's crib rocking at a steady pace on the wooden floor of the cabin. She dressed back up, walked into the kitchen. She could still hear the crib coasting back and forth. Uh, George? She called out in a mildly hesitant voice. She felt as if something was off, but she just knew it had to be her husband, because he was due home any minute now. She began to slowly walk towards the baby's room, the unwelcoming feeling of dread making itself known to her. She said she opened the door to the room and as soon as she pushed it open, the rocking came to an abrupt stop. There in the dimly lit room was a tall matte black figure. It was so tall in fact that it was slightly hunched over to keep from touching the ceiling, which according to my great-great-grandma was about seven feet tall. It had long arms that seemed almost too long for its body, and its face. Oh God, his face, as she said so many times recanting the story to my grandpa. Its face had no real distinctive features other than two white eyes and a mouth full of sharp teeth, curled into a sickening grin. Its fingers were long and had sharp nails and claws on the ends. It was frozen just standing there smiling this terrible smile at her, with its hands curled around Ethel, who oddly wasn't making any noise at all. She said it felt like an eternity that they stood there with their locked gazes, but in reality was a matter of seconds when she screamed and started shouting the Bible verse, The Lord is my shepherd. The thing dropped my grandmother, tore out of the house at an unreal speed. Harriet ran and slammed the front door and locked it. She made damn sure it was really George when he came knocking, wanting in when he got home about 15 minutes after the whole ordeal. She said it was the scariest thing she ever experienced, and she never knew what exactly to make of that encounter, but she always said it was nothing of this world, that she could feel its intentions were of no good. She never told anyone except my great-great-grandpa, because back then, talking about that kind of stuff was taboo and people would think something was wrong with you, that you were either mentally sick or maybe even spiritually. But that's not the last she heard from this creature. A few weeks after the incident, they acquired a dog to keep guard of the property because Harriet was so shaken by the event. One night, while in bed, both Harriet and George heard the dog going crazy outside in the front porch, snarling and growling, which soon subsided into whimpering and in silence. George got up and went to go grab his trousers and his shotgun, but was stopped in mid-action by the sound of the doorknob being twisted slowly back and forth, then violently followed by loud scratching at the door. He grabbed his gun 
and yell for whoever it was to state their name, because he was armed. As soon as he spoke, the door stopped moving, and the sound of faint footsteps could be heard walking off the porch. Against Harriet's wishes, he ran outside only to see no one around. He fired a shot into the woods and yelled for whoever it was to stay away from their house or they'd end up regretting it. That's when he saw it, in the light of the full moon. He saw what looked like a shadow to be seven feet tall, a emaciated man with unnatural long arms run out from behind the shed and into the woods on all fours at an alarming speed. He was so spooked he almost tripped up, the steps running back inside, and before he could even get up the steps, the dog crawled out from under the porch and ran inside the house where my dog ended up keeping it at night, because Harriet couldn't bear to have thought of it being out there alone with that thing. That was the last encounter they ever had as far as I've ever been told. I live in Burlington, Ontario, a nice lakeside city near Toronto. The following story takes place on a school trip in the 8th grade. At my school, everyone would go on two trips their final year at the school. One trip in the fall which was usually a religious camping trip, approximately 40 minutes outside the city, and a second trip in the spring, in Ottawa, where we would explore the city and visit museums. The first trip was boring as it was basically a religious class extended by three days while the second trip had more freedom and was much more exciting. This year, however, my class was allowed on a third trip. This was to camp, I will not name, about four miles away from the Algonquin Provincial Park. The camp was at one of the many lakes in the park and was set up to be like a typical summer camp. The cabins were spread out in wooded areas around the park as you'd expect. Boy and girl cabins were separate. The girls' cabins were the closest to the lake, almost in the forest, and built on a gravel road. Our cabin was the largest, but the most uncomfortable. The other cabins had windows that could open and shut, but ours were so old and appeared to be thin bug screens and a door that wouldn't very much close all the way. I never went camping as my family hated it, and this was my first impression, and I began to see why. The first evening out, we were all gathered around outside the mess hall for a fun nighttime activity. The counselors told us about our hermit that lived nearby, and the activity was to go to where he lived. We did this in groups, but the activity seemed kind of random to everyone. All the groups were loud and kept screaming as we eventually made our way to the hermit's home, which was basically a log cabin. After we headed back to the camp, we never saw anything strange, but other groups described seeing a creep lurking in the darkness as well as a pair of glowing blue eyes in the woods. I shrugged this off thinking the hermit in the wood story was made up by the counselors to creep us out, and the eyes were simply one of the counselors. After we went to sleep, I was awoken to the sound of someone sprinting down the gravel road towards our cabin. This freaked me out at first, then the thought crossed my mind that it could just be an animal. That thawed too passed as I heard the gravel crunchers at our cabin. It was soft, but I could tell it was a person lurking outside. My bed was right next to the door that wouldn't shut or lock, and the screens weren't covered by anything, so whoever was out there could see inside easily. I was scared stiff and ready to scream, expecting the door to open, but it never did. The gravel walker outside soon ran off towards the woods. I chalked it up to possibly being the hermit as it was three in the morning when this happened. I didn't think the counselors would be up. I fell asleep again shortly after. This was the creepiest thing that happened the rest of the trip. It rained non-stop the rest of the trip and a few of the other campers got sick with the flow. I didn't have answers as to what happened that night, but the following year, my sister went on the same trip with her class. They'd done the hermits during the night activity as well, and nothing weird happened. But she explained on one of the days while exploring the woods with their friends they saw the hermit sitting on a log in the distance. While I'm aware this story isn't the scariest in the world, I was unnerved at the realization that the hermit was real and he really could have been wandering outside our cabin at 3 in the morning. It's been 10 years since my trip there and I've never gone camping again.
One day in 2015, me and my family decided to go up into the mountains for the 4th of July. We didn't have a big family. Oh, just me, my mom and my two siblings. My sister was three and my older brother was 17. I was 15 at the time. Me and my brother both shared a tent while my mom and my little sister had a little trailer that only fit one. I never liked this campsite. It was always dark in a way. Like the air wasn't so free. It was all musk or in a way tense. Well, we were really deep in the forest area. This campsite was shut down in 2013. So we took the chance to save money and go to an abandoned campsite for the hell of it. We once went there before shut down. There were no bathrooms, no water, and no one was around. It was nice and quiet. Me and my brother decided to check out the site. When we were there for about 10 minutes, we got away from camp. We came across an old cabin. It was very old and abandoned. Being myself, I wanted to go inside. It took my brother a good five minute argue to let me go. When he finally agreed, we headed inside. It was all torn down. It wasn't very small. It was like a regular medium sized house. It was ruins though. I noticed one drawing on the wall that somehow stood out from all the others. It was like a bowl and a human, long arms, long legs. It had a saying, like, they're watching, they see you now, once there's now yours to suffer. Those words gave me chills. I watched so many scary movies that I just ignored it. It's a very scary looking house. There is always going to be that one creepy artist willing to give it a good scare. After taking a closer look at the artwork, we decided to go upstairs. The cabin was mostly empty. When we got upstairs, it was like a loft. A pair of stairs that led to one huge room. Like the whole room was upstairs. It was completely empty. Except there was just one little box in the of the room, which was also empty. This is when it gets kind of fuzzy. It had two horses on it. I was a very curious so I opened it. To my surprise there were a couple photos in it. I only remember three of the pictures. I know there were more though. One had a picture of a little family. It was black and white. A little girl. She looked like she was from four to six years old and she had a big smile. There was a lady holding two toddlers. They didn't look like infants. They were definitely old enough to sit up on their own. But. They all had huge smiles. Then there was a man. He had a compelling look. He wasn't smiling like the others. He had no hair. He was standing in front of them in a way. Like I couldn't see the other's outfits because of his shadow. I remember he had an axe in one hand and he was holding the girl's hand. In the background there was a forest like the one that was around the cabin. It looked like to be the same cabin. It had flowers, a little stone path and more. There wasn't any writing on it, of course. The roof wasn't broken then as well. The other picture was more interesting and way more chilling. It was a picture of the land the camp was now on. I could see the little landmark that told you where you are. In this picture, the man had the little girl on his back. She had the same smile and the guy had the same face as the other picture. There were the little houses and such in the background like a mini town. Behind the man you could see a little pathway of rocks with a red stain on it. I personally thought it was blood. You could see dead animals such as deer, rats, and etc., but I couldn't really tell if they were skinned or not. But it was still really creepy. It's odd. I remember the water being a dark red, but that's about it. I wanted to give these to a local museum, so I stuck them in my dress pocket. Let's just say that was a huge mistake. By the time we got back to the camp, it was dark. I remember eating a hot dog and s'mores, telling scary stories and heading to the tents to cast some Z's. I woke up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. My tent was, let's say, if I was running, I would be at the side of the mountain. I was walking to find a place to go to the bathroom. When I was about to squat down, I saw something bright. It was like a light behind a tree. When I took a look at it, I started hearing what sounded like chains. I was literally about to pee myself. It really didn't help that I was literally squatting down to go to the bathroom. It looked like a person. I couldn't see anything or any features, but it was a shape and I could see chains. I think it noticed me. 
I was shaking dead quiet. My hand still on the rim of my pajama pants. I was shocked. I couldn't move. It started to slowly move backward. It was making light. Lighting up the forest as it goes. Brighter than any light source. I watched as it got faster and started running up the mountain backwards. Like up the hill at almost 90 freaking degrees. So steep you couldn't even climb it with ropes. I was about to crap myself. When I got to the very top it disappeared. I woke up everyone after I was able to move again. We packed up and left. I threw the pictures out the window, not even caring anymore. Let me start off by saying that this happened last year. I am a male and I was 16 at the time. My parents own a pretty big cabin up in the mountains, and once it hit winter break, we would go to the cabin and stay there until January. I always loved going up to the cabin because there was just so much to do. It was pretty big and advanced too. Well, we headed up there like any usual time. And on the first weekend, we were there my parents decided to go out for dinner. This meant I would have the whole cabin to myself, and I was excited to say the least. After they left I quickly got a bunch of junk food and turned on the PS4. It was pretty ironic because I was playing a game that takes place at a winter lodge. The game was called Until Dawn, and it is a horror game. I had played for about an hour when something hit a window in the main room loudly. I jumped and my heart immediately started to race. I calmed myself and headed over to the window to see what it was. There was a harsh blizzard outside so I gave up on looking out there and all I could tell that someone threw a snowball out the window. But, who would be crazy enough to be out here during a blizzard? I tried to distract my mind by turning off all the lights and continuing to play the game. After another 30 minutes, someone knocked on the front door loud enough for me to hear. My parents wouldn't let me open the door for strangers at 16, but I figured I could still check through the window by the door to see who it was. I approached the window and used my fingers to pry open the blinds and peek outside only to be met with another set of dark eyes. I couldn't help but let out a scream that cracked as I jumped. I immediately felt my heart skip a few beats as I tried to comprehend what was happening. Suddenly, a rock smashed through the window by the door and I ran into the kitchen to grab a knife before ducking behind the counter. I heard the heavy footsteps of boots and a man grunted as he walked. He headed towards the room with my PS4 and the TV on to look for me. Once his outline was out of view, I headed into the basement. My dad had a rifle in there, but I didn't know exactly where it was. I tiptoed to the basement door and shut it behind me as I descended down the steps. At this point, I was more scared than I ever imagined I could be, but I tried to focus. I eventually found an old flip phone and quickly called the police. I explained the situation, but it probably came out as rushed half words. They told me to get a weapon and remain calm since they couldn't send anyone until the storm cleared. I hung up and set the phone down on the counter as my chest ached from my heart pounding against it. As if the man heard me, he had smashed open the basement door and quickly ran down the stairs. I hid behind an open door, and since my basement was large, I tried to form a plan with whatever thoughts I could muster. It was a terrible idea but I planned on waiting until a walk through the door. That way I could lock him in the room and run for the main floor and outside. It was hard for me to hold my breath and I couldn't help but breathe heavily. The only way he didn't hear my breath was probably because he was grunting loudly. He didn't seem mentally stable and he had our double bladed axe from our shed. God knows what other things he would have taken from the shed. To my surprise he didn't see me through the crack of the door and walked by. I took two big steps and slammed the door before going to lock it. The only problem was, I hadn't had the time to think clearly, and there was no lock. My memory gets foggy at this point and I hate reliving it, but I'm pretty sure it went down something like this. I went to lock the door and there was no lock. Before I could turn and run he had already kicked the door and it slammed into my face. I remember blood pouring from my nose and I stumbled up the stairs as quickly as I could. My nose was broken. I tried to get out as I opened the door and took off. I quickly got out of view because of the blizzard and I laid in the snow to hide. My body hadn't processed how cold I was since I was overtaken by the adrenaline and shock and the pain. 
After a few moments I heard the grunts of the man come into view. He hadn't seen me yet but was following my footprints and blood trail. I got up and sprinted as fast as I could into the woods. I couldn't see a thing and tripped on something. I don't remember what it was. I fell forward and rolled down a small hill into a snow and twigs and leaves and my face ached from the door and whatever I tripped over had scratched up my ankle. I laid there with fiend light an hour, but was probably only five minutes. I thought I heard his grunt somewhere in the middle, but I'm not sure. After I assumed it was safe, I slowly limped, walked back to the cabin and hid my closet. I slumped down and held onto a kitchen knife. There was no way I was going to trap myself in the basement to look for a gun. I'm not sure when, but I must have passed out because the last thing I remember was waking up as the police shined a light in my face. I hadn't any extreme injuries or else I would have been surely dead. I was taken to the hospital where my parents waited for me. This year we are not planning on going up to the cabin because I don't think me or my parents could handle being there. I just can't imagine what would have happened if I hadn't tripped and fallen down the small hill in the blizzard. I know I'll be staying close to my family and my switchblade this Christmas. First off, I just want to say that this story is a bit anticlimactic, but I hope you still find it interesting. Back in the early spring of 2018, me and my dad decided to spend the Saturday at our cabin in Wisconsin, which is about a two and a half hours drive away from where we live in Minnesota. All the snow had finally melted, so we decided that it was a good time to go and check out the place. We do this every now and then to make sure the place hasn't been damaged by any people bears or weather. One winter a few years ago, when part of the roof caved in under the weight of the snow, we had to fix it. But the roof has been fixed since then and has been holding up ever since. Normally, when we are there, we get a lot of work done, but this time we decide to relax the day away, listening to country radio and talking about how many different things we always do. Whenever it got a little quiet, or when my dad decided to do something. I started to listen to the music on my phone while browsing the slowed down internet. This pretty much went on the whole day. There wasn't really much to do out in the middle of nowhere. Eventually, nighttime rolled around. We had just finished up eating, and we usually watch a movie at this point, but we forgot the CD player, so we just talked for a while and went to bed. Unfortunately, I've had insomnia for years, probably, for most of my life. I don't remember how long I was lying awake. I was just staring at the ceiling, and would eventually roll over to stare at the wall. It doesn't take long for my dad to fall asleep and start letting out his loud snores. I'm not sure how he does it. At some point during the night, I heard a few cat meows outside my window. I thought about it for a few seconds and wondered why I was hearing a cat meow in the woods out in the middle of nowhere. I got up and looked at the window and started scanning the yard that was lit up by the house light. I never saw any cats. And after looking out the window for a few minutes, I just started to think about how creepy trees look at night when a little bit of light hits them. They go from brown to this dead gray color, and without the leaves, the branches look like a mangled mass. Maybe it was just me freaking myself out. I decided to go back to bed and try to fall asleep, but for some reason, I just couldn't. I just kept thinking about it. I figured that it was probably a cat, but what if it wasn't? Again, we were in the woods and many miles away from any town. Then I started thinking, what if it was someone or something trying to lure me out? Normally, I am the type of guy to go investigate noises. I take security very seriously and sleep with a German Shepherd and a shotgun. But since the woods kind of scare me at night, I decided not to go check. For all I know, it could have been some sort of scary creature. While well, I looked up my experience on the internet, the first thing that popped up was a story of someone following the sound of a kitten in the woods. But when they got closer to the meowing, they heard heavy breathing and footsteps nearby in the darkness. After reading that, I'm definitely glad I didn't go out there and check. And apparently, from other stories I've read, Wisconsin is no stranger to sightings of other terrifying and unknown things.
I live in southwestern Virginia, on the borders of Tennessee and Kentucky. I grew up with stories of ghosts in the area and I never believed those stories until I was older. The story of why goes as follows. One night, my friends and I were leaving a church youth service when I took my cousin home. Soon after I walked my friends Cody and Kirkland home as well. Kirkland lived on the top of a mountain, and Cody lived on the other side of him. As we're traveling up the mountain, Cody says, That was weird, did you all see that guy on the side of the road? I looked over at Kirkland, who was laughing, and then looked back at Cody who turned around as though he was looking for the guy. There's no one back there Cody. Kirkland and I hadn't seen anyone, we thought maybe it was Cody messing with us or his imagination was running wild. Cody tells us the guy was wearing an orange shirt with camouflage shorts and had a flashlight, but we dismissed this as we'd not seen the guy or any flashlight. Cody continued insisting the guy was back there, at which point I pointedly asked if he wished for me to turn around and prove to him there was no one there. To my surprise, Cody said yes. I've known Cody for a long time, but looking at him now, he seemed more serious than I'd ever seen him before, and even a little afraid. I nodded and turned the vehicle around to search for this guy he had spoke of. We were going around a curve when Cody started shouting, there he is, there's the man. Staring intently we noticed the outline of a man in a flashlight moving around on the ground. We started to chill for a second, when another vehicle came around the corner, dimmed his lights, and the man vanished. I don't mean he simply ran off or hid somewhere, there was literally nowhere for him to run or hide on this part of the mountain. I mean the man truly vanished before our eyes. Seeing this, we all freaked out before driving back to my mom's. My mom, upon hearing the story couldn't stop laughing. She for some reason, thought the whole matter was hilarious. My mom went with us when I went back to drop my friends off. We didn't see the man so she told me to take another way home, in case he had wandered a different path. Still there was no man. Cody still sees the man on occasion, and has likened to calling him the flashlight feller. But every time he's seen him, the guy seems to vanish into thin air. We still have no explanation for this, but ever since I witnessed this event, I've believed in ghosts ever since.